それでは時間になりましたのでセッション It is now time to resume the session, the second half of the session this morning. We will be asking John, Professor and Dr. John Matthews from University of Melbourne. His specialty is epidemiology. He will be talking about the cancer risks following low dose radiation from CT scans. What can be said about reverse causation? And after that, we will invite Professor、uh, Tsuda Toshihide from University of Okayama. He is from the Department of Human Ecology Graduate School of Environmental and Life Science. He will be talking about how to exchange information on scientific evidence in the case of radiation health effects. I'd like to pass the microphone to the professors and the co、um, moderators. Please. Thank you. Thank you very much.、Um, I'm very pleased to have been invited.、Um, it's a long way from Australia, but、um, Japan is closer to Australia than Europe and North America. So, in some senses,、uh, it's a short trip for people t r a v e l i n g I'm going to be talking about the results. From studies of CT scan, that's computed tomography, X ray scans in young Australians. The importance of our study is that the dose from a typical CT scan is less than 10 millisieverts, which is much, much less than the 100 millisieverts. That people have tried to say is the level at which there is no effect of low dose radiation. So, the themes for the talk are talking about cancer risks following diagnostic CT scan radiation in people exposed before the age of 20. I'm going to look at potential biases in the results. Such as those due to reverse causation. I'll give you a quick look at some preliminary results of cancer risks following ionising radiation from diagnostic nuclear medicine procedures. And I'll compare the risks from our data with those from the lifespan study、uh, and some other studies. Now, The implications of the old data and the new data have, they imply that assumptions about the dose response curve are not necessarily those we've had from the past, and I'll talk in more detail about that. And of course, we need to worry about future risks from diagnostic radiation. Now, it's important to Recognise that Japan has three reasons for being interested in low dose radiation. Obviously, the first is the long term effects of the atomic bombs, but that information has at least given us some very good data for understanding the effects of radiation generally. The second reason Japan has for being interested in low dose radiation is that it is apparently the highest user of CT scan, diagnostic CT scans in the world on a per capita basis, higher than in the USA, Australia, and the UK. So it's very important to understand that risk. And of course, the major focus of this meeting. Is low dose radiation from Fukushima and the effects both short and long term on those exposed? Now, what about the background to CT scans? Well, there were theoretical papers by David Brenner and others from about the year 
predicting an increased risk of cancer following childhood CT scans. And that was based on lifespan study results. Mark Pierce uh, in the UK did a parallel study with us and we were in communication for some years. He published before us and showed that CT scans in the UK caused an increase in brain cancer and leukaemia following childhood CTs. Our Australian study uh, showed actual increases in brain cancer, leukaemia, but also other solid cancers, almost all solid cancers. Our study had about four times the ionising radiation exposure of the UK study and about four to five times as much low-dose exposure, that is exposure under 100 millisieverts uh, as in the lifespan study. Of course, the follow-up in the lifespan study is much longer than ours, but in the longer term, follow-up of medically exposed cohorts will answer the low-dose radiation question better than the lifespan study. So how did we do our study? Well, our exposure records were records of CT scans funded by Medicare, which is the Australian Government Medical Insurance Scheme, for all persons aged 0 to 19 between 1985 and 2005. And our outcome were the first diagnoses of cancer more than 12 months after CT exposure. And we used data linkage in a high security unit at the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare. And the data were analysed in de-identified form by us at the University of Melbourne. So we had 680,000 people who, um, who were CT exposed, over 10 million non-exposed, and of course we had to use uh, uh, complex techniques, mostly Poisson regression, uh, with age measured in single years, stratifying for age, sex and year of birth, uh, and um, all that I'll show you in terms of the results is really um, uh, quite well founded st statistically. Just to show you that uh, the data look like what we'd expect, we've got the childhood peak in acute lymphoid leukaemia. And we've got uh, um, the characteristic curve by age of the incidence of brain cancer. And, uh, um, so how many person years of follow-up um, did we have? Well, amongst the exposed, we had about six and a half million person years of follow-up. In the unexposed, 177 million years of follow-up. The mean length of follow-up for exposed was 9.5 years, for unexposed, 17.3 years. And the number of cancers in the exposed group was 3,150, and in the unexposed group, 57,524. So, we had 3,150 cancers in the exposed group, ignoring the cancers that occurred less than 12 months uh, after the CT exposure. When we allowed longer lag periods of five years or 10 years, we obviously had fewer cancers, but in each case, we're able to calculate the expected number of cancers in the exposed group for those three different lag periods. And as you can see down the bottom, the incidence rate ratio, which is the observed divided by the expected, is increased by 24% at one year lag, 21% at five year lag, and 18% at a 10 year lag. And if we look at the re relationship between the increasing risk of cancer and the number of CT scans, you can see if we have no increase at no CT, um, it goes up with the number of scans. And it's very highly significant trend. And even if you take out the unexposed, and just look at the trend amongst those who had at least one CT scan, it's still highly significant. And we found increases of almost all cancers. Uh, I'll talk about some exceptions later. Uh, brain cancer, soft tissue cancer, thyroid, leukaemia, 
solid. And of course, we're particularly interested in brain cancer because the majority of CT scans in this age group are CT scans of the head. About 60% of the scans were scans of the head. And you can see the uh, increase in risk for brain cancer on average is about uh, twofold uh, with confidence intervals from 1.69 to 2.43. So how do we measure CT risk, cancer risk following CT scans? Well, we can look at the excess relative risk and the average risk increases at about 16% per CT it's 24% over the whole study, but that's because people had multiple CTs. And the more extreme risk is if we look at subgroups, for instance, uh, uh, people who developed um, exposures, uh, cancer after exposure at an early age, the increase in risk is about 200% per CT, 200% uh, over the baseline risk. Then we can look at the absolute risk, which on average is at the present time is about one extra cancer per 2,000 scans. But that absolute risk will continue to increase as we follow the cohort for longer. And then we can also think about the attributable risk for a person with cancer de actually developing after exposure. The average attributable risk in the cohort so far is about 14% per CT, a 14% probability that the CT they had uh, a single CT um, caused their cancer. But if we look at the subgroup with brain cancer after exposure at a young age, the attributable risk is about two-thirds, 67%. And in the next slide, uh, we have an example to explain that. If a child's exposed to a CT scan before the age of five, then the, in the years that follow, the average rate of brain cancer is about three times as great as for unexposed. So we just use the three to keep the numbers simple to explain the concept. So the attributable risk is the probability that the cancer was caused by exposure. And this is calculated as three minus one, which is the uh, uh, risk without exposure divided by the total risk. So it's two thirds probability that uh, in that particular instance, uh, a, brain, uh, a head scan with brain cancer uh, when the exposure was a young age, attributable risk of two thirds. Now we also need to think about cancer risks and the site of radiation. Uh, cancer risks tended to be increased most in the tissues actually irradiated. And uh, we've summarized some of that data in the, our BMJ publication. Uh, but the most dramatic increase was brain cancers after head CTs. Now this is consistent with the assumption that uh, the CT radiation has caused the cancer, but a devil's advocate or a critic could also argue that it might also be due to the use of CTs to investigate early symptoms of cancer, uh, brain cancer, or of a precancerous condition. Uh, and because of that possibility of reverse causation, that's why we looked at those different lag periods in the BMJ paper. So cancers at the shortest lag periods following CT scans are almost certainly due to reverse causation. Uh, as I said, when symptoms of cancer or a precancerous condition have led to the CT scan being done. And it was for that reason that in our BMJ paper, we chose to exclude all cancers occurring at a lag of less than 12 months. And we'll look at some of that data in more detail later. So if we look at the uh, diagnosis rate of cancer in the period following the CT scan, and this particular slide is quite an important one. This box up here is the rate of diagnosis of cancer in the first three months after the CT scan. They're quarterly rates. And you can see very clearly that in that first three months, all those CT scans would have been done for the diagnosis of cancer. It's very, very clear. But the rate of diagnosis of cancer then falls very dramatically over the subsequent 
three quarters, so that by one to two years after the scan, the rate of diagnosis of cancer is quite low, and then it increases with the lag period because with increasing lag period, you've got increasing age and increasing risk of cancer with increasing age. Okay. And uh, this, this just uh, shows the same data in slightly different form. And then if we look at the data and we've truncated the uh, first quarter data to get it all on one slide and we put on a log scale and we've got the rates in exposed with the error bars and we've got the rates in the unexposed. Uh, now, to, to understand why there's a rate of cancer in unexposed by lag period, the unexposed, we've matched them for age, sex and year of birth with the people who were in the exposed group at that lag period. So that's how we can have those two. And as you can see, the parallel lines are consistent with the possibility uh, and with the assumption of um, the excess relative risk model. But those data are got without assuming the excess relative risk model. Okay, now this is a rather complicated slide, but it's really just taking our, the summarising the results of our mixture modelling, which is trying to sep use two distributions on that last slide to separate the reverse causation lag period from the causation lag period. And you can see here that um, the reverse causation lag period is virtually over by two years of age. So our initial assumption to exclude cancers less than one year lag period was certainly well justified. Perhaps we should have gone to two years, but at least uh, we've now got uh, important benchmarks in place which tell us that after one or two years after CT scan exposure, there's not a problem from reverse causation. Okay, um, now the reverse causation model has provided 95% uh, credibility interval estimates of, for the average dose response coefficient. As part of estimating the reverse causation effect, we've also had to estimate the cancer effect and we used an excess relative risk model which took into account the fact or the possibility that the risk is greater following exposures at young ages. And, um, and we got a, a much more significant fit to the data with that age-dependent model. And just to give you a flavour of the results coming out of that, you can see that at age 10, the excess relative risk from our analyses is 0.11 to 0.16 per millisievert, uh, whereas at age 30, uh, it's uh, much reduced, about a third. So these estimates, adjusted for reverse causation, are consistent with our BMJ results, but they're higher than almost all previous estimates in the literature. Are our results believable? Well. What other problems might our study have had? Well, it's possible that in those who actually got cancers in our cohort, the um, doses may have been greater than the estimated doses. Maybe, maybe our estimates were wrong. We can't exclude that, but they won't be very wrong. And, of course, all studies um, are subject to measurement error estimates. But it may well be there's a bias for the doses in those who actually got cancers. As our model 
takes explicit account of age-related susceptibility, it may make more efficient use of the data. And that's why the coefficients from this analysis are slightly different from the analyses in the BMJ paper, but very consistent with them. Um, now, the other possibility is that early cancers are likely to have occurred in persons who are most susceptible for genetic reasons or because of stochastic selection. And the final possibility uh, that we need to think about is that the dose-response curve could have a gradient, that is, the excess relative risk per unit of dose, that's the gradient of the dose-response curve, that is greater at lower average doses, and as I've told you, CT scans, the doses are quite low, the order of 10 millisieverts or less, uh, than at the higher average doses that drove the estimates in the lifespan study of atomic survivors. Now, although there were a lot of people in the lifespan study with doses around 5 millisieverts or less, most of the information about effect came from doses that were higher than 250 millisieverts, which was the mean dose in those who had doses greater than 5 millisieverts. So it's unsurprising that um, dose responses might be different depending on what the actual dose is. And I'll explore that concept in a little bit more detail. Before I do that, uh, I'll just tell you briefly that we've also got nuclear medicine procedure exposures in our cohort. And to cut a long story short, um, we've got an estimate overall exposed people of excess relative risk of, and these again are exposures at young age, of 0.08 per millisievert. And if we exclude um, um, the nuclear medicine procedures that could have been ordered for cancer detection, we get a slightly smaller e estimate, uh, as you can see, but still highly significant. And um, um, I haven't yet completed the reverse formal ca reverse causation analysis on the uh, um, nuclear medicine results. Um, you can understand it, it's pretty intensive stuff. Um, so, the ER uh, excess relative risk dose estimates from the CT study and the nuclear medicine study are substantially greater than from the lifespan study. And so, uh, is there a bias inflating our estimates? Well, uh, we think we've removed the effect of reverse causation. We can't totally say we haven't underestimated CT doses, but that won't make a huge difference. Uh, what factors could explain a real biological difference? Un well, young age of exposure, well, we've taken that into account in our modelling. Early cancer cases would be most susceptible well, we can't quite take that into the, the, the uh, current set of models, but we've developed ways to attack that, but I don't have results for you yet. And um, essentially, what thing we need to uh, focus on is why the excess relative risk per unit of dose coefficients seem to be larger when the dose is low. And just reminding you that the mean dose from CT scans is much lower than the, the, the dose that gave the dose coefficients in the lifespan study. And of course, there can be cell killing at high doses and bystander cell repair, other homeostatic effects at lower doses, uh, which can affect the shape of the dose response curve. So, I'm just going to step back for a moment and, and just think about um, radiation more generally. We've all become comfortable with the idea that radiotherapy is good for treating cancer. We give very large doses, usually targeted at single organs, 
And of course, as a result of that, you get secondary cancers. And um, you can estimate the excess relative risk per gray of radiation from radiotherapy and atomic survivors, CT scans and nuclear medicine. And just scanning down there, you see that as the dose goes up, the gradient go per unit of dose goes down. So uh, we, we can actually um, make that a bit more precise. And if we, to get everything onto one graph, we have to take the logarithm of the excess relative risk per unit of dose and the logarithm of the dose. And as you can see, there's a very high, um, highly significant negative correlation. And uh, the slope of that, you can then just take that result and transform it into uh, a dose response curve that looks like that. In other words, the dose response curve may not be a straight line anywhere. I mean, we, we can't prove this at the moment, but it certainly raises the possibility that um, um, we are more sensitive to radiation at the lower doses, less sensitive at the higher doses because of things like cell killing and radioprotective effects that are induced. So, we, we think that, as suggested by Brenner and others as, uh, in the PNAS paper some years ago, um, and canvassed by a number of other people, we, we really think that the slope of the dose response curve, it's a superlinear curve. It bends down as it goes up. Um, it's likely influenced by cell killing at high doses and homeostatic effects such as DNA repair and bystander responses at the lower doses. And um, the important conclusion, if that cancer risk per unit of dose is really greater at lower doses, it's likely that background radiation is contributing to background rates of cancer. But more importantly, it's reinforcing our understanding that there's very likely to be significant effects of the um, contamination at Fukushima and, and so forth. And because the doses in CT-exposed cohorts are in the right low-dose range, longer-term follow-up of these cohorts will help to answer important radiation questions in the low-dose range. So, just to summarise, the Australian CT scan study was exposed to more low-dose radiation, that is, less than 100 milligray as organ dose or less than 10 or 20 millisieverts as whole body effective dose than the lifespan study of atomic survivors and at a lower average age and uh, younger, lower average uh, dose and younger average age. Risks of leukaemia following CT scan radiation are quite consistent with the risks from the lifespan study of atomic bomb survivors. Some 60% of CT scans are scans of the head with an average organ dose of 40 milligray. Of course, that translates into an effective uh, dose of four and a half milli, uh, millisieverts. So the increase in brain cancers in the CT cohorts is not surprising. Modeling suggests that almost all of the excess cancers at more than 12 months after CT were actually caused by CT scan radiation and excess cancers in the early years after exposure probably occur in persons who are most susceptible for stochastic and or genetic reasons. We think that the dose response curve for radiation is much steeper at lower doses and at short lags, and we think that reflects genetic susceptibility and stochastic selection homeostatic mechanisms such as uh, DNA repair and the bystander response and cell killing at higher doses. And that's got important implications for radiation protection. And uh, I'll leave it there. Um, there are some critical questions we've been asked by people who are skeptical about our results. 
um, and I could address some of those in questions or uh, at the panel discussion later. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very, very interesting presentation. And uh, it does seem that uh, uh, this uh, positive uh, increase uh, at lower doses, which has been hinted at in other studies, does seem here to have been confirmed. Um, we will have questions for clarification now. After uh, Professor Suda's paper, we will have further uh, question period, and this afternoon we will discuss this issue of the 100 millisieverts and the possibility of a threshold there. Uh, so this will be important information. So do we have any questions now? Yes, please. Dr. Sakiyama. Thank you very much. Well, I have two questions. CT scans, depending on the machines and instruments, I believe the dosage is very different. In Australia, what is the, uh, I believe it was 4.5 millisievert is the average dosage per CT scan? In Australia, if that is the case, what is the variation that exists in Australia for CT scans depending on the instruments? That was the first question. And secondly, the those patients who receive CT scans uh, within 12 months, you said you excluded these data, but in certain tumors have much earlier diagnosis, earlier, uh, much earlier symptoms appearance. But if you exclude these under 12 months, for example, um, the no brain tumor and leukemia, well, and depending on the tumor, I believe there is a difference in effect. But do you think there is a difference in effect depending on the type of tumor? Please. Thank you. Um, the dose question is very important. Um, Yes, the average um, effective dose was CT scan um, in our BMJ paper uh, was 4.5 millisieverts. That was higher in the early years, uh, less in more recent years, but we're finalising, we're working on individual organ dose estimates and individual effective dose estimates, you'd understand it's very complex to do that. Getting the algorithms right, we've got to take into account the different kinds of machines that were used, look at the protocols that were used. And we, we haven't got documentation, obviously, in 680,000 cases of what the machine settings were or anything like that, but we have to make the estimates based on what the uh, best guess was of the machine at the time and the settings that would have been used for people of a particular age and body size. So um, to get better estimates than that, we need um, prospectively uh, collected cohorts uh, and it's going to take a few more years before there's a big enough cohort with prospectively collected dose information. Um, so in the meantime, we've got to use um, uh, the best estimates of doses uh, in cohorts such as ours and the uh, UK study. Um, the second question was whether the different kinds of cancers uh, might affect the uh, lag period uh, differentially in terms of uh, the uh, reverse causation period. Of course, that's possible. Um, we know um, from looking at the literature, there are a number of studies uh, where people have looked at the lag period between first symptom 
and diagnosis for conditions such as brain cancer. We know that um, it's very unlikely that that interval is greater than one year in more than a small proportion of brain cancer cases. And we haven't, we haven't looked, brain cancer is the biggest uh, reason why people think our data might be contaminated too much by reverse causation. Uh, so we've looked at that in more detail. Thank you. Please. Can we have a microphone here, please? My name is Segawa. In Hiroshima, Nagasaki, rather than LS, LSS, the value is bigger than that. As Mr. Ham Professor Hanaoka, Hanaoka mentioned, as Ms. Professor Tsuda also said earlier, black rain or other background and the study started in the 1950s. That's one of the contributions. Well, I think you can agree to that. But on, other than that, low uh, dose rate. So per CT, 10 milli or 4.5 millisievert is recorded. Well, I don't think that's a low dose. That's actually deemed as a high dose. So low uh, the uh, dosage is like a environmental uh, dosage. So per hour, per micro civil level. So if someone stays in Fukushima at such a low level, accumulating radi radiation, we have seen a lot of results of the radi uh, radiation. We have have you done any? Uh, those comparison between low, uh, the dose uh, response versus the environmental dose, it doesn't look like there's much difference between the two. Any, have you done any comparison? We don't have any um, environmental data to look at. Um, um, what I think um, you're questioning is the words we use and obviously, uh, 10 millisieverts is low dose when you compare it to uh, non-environmental exposures. Um, but comparing to Fukushima, it, um, the kind of environmental exposures there, um, it's um, relatively higher, as you, you were suggesting. So um, I think we we need perhaps to uh, review the language we use to talk about things being high or low dose uh, and be more specific about it. Um, I, I would just make one comment there. A low LET radiation dose of one millisievert per year so by the time you have, you, by the time a child is 10 years old, it has received 10 millisieverts from natural background radiation. Um, so considering that these doses are cumulative, that's uh, still in the, these doses are still in the low dose range. Yeah. Any further questions? Yes, please. Uh, microphone here, please. I have two questions regarding reverse causation. In evaluating reverse causation, you need to distinguish the reasons why pa patients are getting CT scans. If they have a migraine, they don't know why, and they are suspecting uh, brain tumor. 
So in some children's patients, that would be the case. And in other cases, maybe they were uh, they had accidents. They had um, uh, uh, other reasons. Did you look at the different causes why people decided to go get a CT scan? That's the first question. And regarding the second question, um, regarding the NM, the nuclear medicine uh, impact. You said you will be delving into more study about this area, about what could be the possibility in terms of the, the kind of study that you could undertake in NM. Um, yes, to look at the causes of um, why people had a CT scan. Um, unfortunately, our Medicare system was originally, record system was originally devised just for recording the procedure and doesn't have um, diagnostic information. So it is really quite difficult to make inferences about why a CT scan was ordered. Um, and um, we can do more of that, um, but it involves um, making assumptions that may or may not be justified. So uh, for, again, we need prospectively designed cohorts where the reasons for CT scan as well as the doses are recorded. Um, and the, the second question was, um, if you could just remind me. <laughs> Microphone, please. Nuclear medicine, yeah, okay. Um, well, uh, we can do the um, reverse causation analysis in a similar way. And um, it will be possible for us um, on a case control basis maybe to check the reasons for um, the procedure being done, in particularly in those who had developed a cancer. So it, it, again, it, we've got hundreds of thousands of exposures and just like the CT space, we can't get exact indications, but we may be able to get sample data which will answer, finally put the reverse causation argument to bed. Are there any further questions? Yes, please. Uh, my, um, my name is Yoshida from the Association of Pediatricians. Um, wonderful presentation. Thank you. Uh, we, and since your uh, paper has been published uh, in the world of pediatry, uh, we really were all shocked. Well, in a way, it's kind of an invisible shock, that shock wave that we are feeling. And it seems like people around me, the doctors around me, are using CT scans less. But and in any way, um, I was talking with you yesterday about the same question, and I'm repeating my question in a way. Having read your paper, uh, you were talking about brain cancer, and you are saying that uh, when you uh, expose other organs like stomach and other areas uh, to CT scans, you also saw the increase in the incidence of brain cancer. How could you explain that? Part of that was a coding problem in that somebody had a CT to one organ of the body, it would be coded to that if it was the first CT. And a person could have um, a CT to the head as a second CT. But we, uh, the way we analysed the data, we only analysed it in relation to the first CT. So uh, you can imagine the analyses were really quite complicated and uh, to look at the effects of multiple CTs to different organs would be even more complicated. And 
uh, we decided to defer that kind of analysis until we had organ doses for every organ and then that would allow us to look at the cumulative organ doses um, rather than uh, and, and use the information from multiple CT scans to the maximum effect. Okay, thank you very much. We shall move on now to the next paper by uh, 